You're listening to Politics After the Pandemic, where we think transnationally with social scientists and political activists about recent cultural shifts in their relation to COVID-19, capitalism and other structures of oppression, and how social movements, educators and researchers might respond. I'm Erica Lagalis, an anthropologist of social movements and your host, as we continue in this episode to talk with Ella Drashkevich, fellow anthropologist and researcher of conspiracy theory. We've been talking about what it means to approach the idea of conspiracy theory as social scientists. In the last episode, we went over questions of definition. What is conspiracy theory anyway? Now we're going to hear from Ella about her research of conspiracy theory during the COVID-19 pandemic specifically, which we can also read about in her co-authored study titled Rights, Responsibilities, and Revelations, COVID-19 Conspiracy Theories in the State which is found in the book Viral Loads, Anthropologies of Urgency in the Time of COVID-19, published by UCL Press last year in 2021. Together with Elisa Sobo, you've done a great comparative study of conspiracy theory activity uh, in Ireland, Poland, and the United States in this paper. And you can see in this study that that conspiracy theories are different in different places uh, because of different histories of the state and state power and relationships between the citizens and the state. And the comparative study, you know, is great. It also, it's another classic anthropological method that highlights the importance of place and context, right? And shows us how even seemingly similar conspiratorial ideas can vary in important historically particular ways. Maybe we should run through those case studies now. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, so what we were interested in is this in moment in COVID pandemic history where there is a uh, concern coming from the public and governments and health authorities that there is this proliferation of conspiracy theories. And the, it's almost at the level of moral panic that Everybody is believing on conspiracy theories, what is going on, as if it was some sort of novelty. So uh, we were interested in this, uh, what is going on? And we wanted, we, we looked at different, though similar, conspiracy theories uh, in spaces where we have long research interests. And in those places, like in other locations, people expressed belief that the state is lying to us. States are the government's state um, is plotting something, COVID does not exist, and the state is lying, right? And we wanted to, and you can look at it uh, if you are not anthropologists and think, you know, people everywhere believe in conspiracy theories, like the world is mad, right? But then we wanted to understand as anthropologists, what are the localized meanings of those conspiracy theories? Why in those places people express those views? And in each place, there was a different history behind the same sentence. So everywhere people say, the state is lying to us. Uh, some people, not all people, of course. But for instance, in Ireland, the concern was that state here was the state uh, when the state started to introduce restrictions and new regulation, the reason why people were saying this, uh, the, this me, were making those assumptions that state is lying to us because of a very unique um, moment in Irish history. Uh, just before pandemic hit Ireland, uh, there were elections, which were three-way elections and three parties, uh, each party, got 30 percent more or less uh, of of votes so it's a it's a big big issue now how do we divide power and right. then pandemic comes and there are new rules established which means the party that should be outgoing party remains in power and the decision is made that they will stay in power until things calm down and they will worry later and they will we like start discussions about forming new government later. So they were, they, they position in power was prolonged. And in this context, people are starting to be suspicious 
how did that happen? How is that possible? We were just voting against those people. 60% people voted against that party and now they are staying in power. So it is not very surprising or irrational that people started to come up with theories. Of course, not everyone ends up with a theory of suspicion of conspiracy, but we as anthropologists can have some understanding and sympathy for people theorizing, right? Yeah. And sometimes the people end up with, you know, with bad answers to good questions. And at the same time, for instance, um, in Poland, uh, it was time of elections when pandemic hit. And uh, there was different situation because Polish government was very reluctant to introduce uh, restrictions. They lasted very uh, short time. Uh, and then government announced, ah, oh, pandemic is over, let's go to the elections. And people started to be very suspicious and say, and they started saying, hey, the government is lying to us because they thought that government is hiding the truth about the numbers, about that they were downplaying COVID for their own political advantage. I like how it's in both cases, uh, the situation is affected by electoral politics, but in one case, the state is assumed to be expanding, uh, exaggerating numbers in order to stay in power. And in the other case, the state is assumed to be downplaying numbers to stay in power. <laughs> exactly. And then you have also uh, to complicate matters more in Poland, you have also the situation uh, where there are super right wing groups, alt right groups, uh, which are not happy even with the, which are so right-wing that even current right-wing uh, government is not right-wing enough for them. And uh, when the current government uh, announces everything is fine, Americans are discovering a vaccine and they promise, Donald Trump promised they will give us the vaccine first, those super right-wing groups are saying, oh, no, 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 no. This is the capitalist imperialist uh, uh, state uh, using us as in the trials. We are once again used by, uh, by the empire uh, and we are the victims. Once again, we hear the, those uh, representatives of those nationalist groups. Because so reference you, back to World War II, right? That sort of cultural history and feeling of being uh, a battleground or used as cat and fodder in the wars between other nations, right? Yes, this war and the previous war and <laughs> before it. Every other war, yeah. Every other war, Polish uh, nationalists see themselves as victims there. So, so you can see how at, in one moment you can have different people endorsing conspiracy theories for different reasons. But when you look at the surface, all, all of them seem like saying the same thing. The government is lying to us. Mm -hmm. But they do so for different reasons. And this connects us to United States, right? The, the Donald Trump supposedly promised Polish government those vaccines. So with Elisa Soba, we moved to, uh, to, to look at the research conducted by her in the United States. I like before, before going to the United States, I like, uh, I want to say, I like how there's academics who say things like, because uh, you cite this, um, when it comes to Eastern Europe, a culture of suspicion is justified given the high number of actual conspiracies experienced in the last century, right? as if there's no actual conspiracies elsewhere in the world of politics. Like, I just, I noticed that and I find how Mm, it seems in many ways, even academic discourse about conspiracy theory is cultural, like betraying a lot about where the scholar thinks democracy is supposed to be happening, like conspiracy theorizing is legitimate in the global south or in Eastern Europe, where there are you know, obviously things like power relations and corruption, uh, but among, you know, properly developed, civilized, liberal democracies, even to suggest the notion is uh, considered insane. <laughs> yeah, this is something that um, that I also wrote about in my own paper on HPV vaccination in Ireland, and exactly this 
something that I find troubling in anthropological research of conspiracy theories. Mm. I think we, what we are good at as anthropologists is that we are actually bringing case studies from global east, global south, because actually most of what we know about conspiracy theories mm. in as academic community is based on the research conducted in and for on the United States. Yeah. And uh, so very little what we know about conspiracy theories is based on Europe. Only recently, last 10 years, some research started to uh, uh, be produced on Europe. Most of what we know is based on the United States. So anthropologists are quite good with bringing new, different um, case studies, different examples. However, I did find, I do agree with you, there is this pattern uh in, in writing about conspiracy theories that the further from anthropologist office yeah. the more forgiving of conspiratorial mind people are so mm -hmm. like um so when we are talking about conspiracy theories uh i don't know in timor leste in mongolia in um in in different locations around the world uh, in, in African locations, in, in South American locations, then anthropologists have this empathy and understanding of, hey, people are oppressed, have been oppressed for centuries, and conspiracy theory is kind of a weapon of the week. Right. This is way for people to make sense of the really complex realities, and we cannot be angry or you know, add them that they come up with those uh, stories and narratives which are uh, not correct, right? But right. the closer to anthropologists' home, the less inclined anthropologists are to be forgiving of the half-truths. Yes, anthropologists love subalterns elsewhere. Yes, <laughs> and so, so when, uh, when we are talking about right-wing populism in Hungary, that's you know you, the tone is very different right. when we are talking about right-wing populism in italy in uk suddenly this is about danger it's uh it's a threat to democracy right and i i think it is the the issue is here that we do not um that first like i, I there are some scholars who explicitly say that they do not that for them, the goal is not uh, being a judge of veracity of people's claims. And this is just a theoretical exercise when they study conspiracy theories in learning about knowledge, different forms of knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. But I find it difficult because just like people in the West experience consequences of conspiratorial thinking, in populism, in uh, polarization, in conflict in the states, mm -hmm. so do people who experience or witness or uh, conspiratorial beliefs in the east or south. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, so that's for me like the this um, ignorance for the consequences that conspiracy theories might cause or not cause, but you know might cause like, might might create everywhere and around the world. Yeah, there's I a certain find... indulgence there, yeah. Yes. Um, yes, there's a certain paternalism. Um, yeah, that this, this is just- People's capacity for rationality, perhaps, right? A sort yes, of that... colonial uh, mentality around uh, people's capacity for rationality and their uh, being linked to their closeness to the metropole or something. And I, like, and I think because so much of discourse on conspiracy theories is very vague, when people use that term, it's they very often confuse it with fake news, with misinformation. Um, it, it's very hard to to say exactly what conspiracy theory is, right? Why one some theories are labeled as conspiracy theories and others are not, right? It's very fluid definition very often. I got something I want to say about that, about class, actually, and we're going to get to that. Let's do America first, though. Mm -hmm. so, uh, so I think America is here a very good case, and like Ireland, actually, because both are the West, because having 
though for me, what was interesting in the study we did with Elisa is exactly that we brought East and West together. Right. So that prevents us from denormalizing or normalizing and trying to find what those spaces have in common. And again, we started with this uh, interest in why, what is behind the claims that the government is lying to us. And in the United States, what uh, we found out mostly based on work uh, by Elisa in the United States is that here pandemic hit at the very difficult time of the um, for, for American history, where the, the American dream was slowly dying. Mm -hmm. And this idea that people have control over their lives, that everything is possible, that um, you know, you if you work hard, you will achieve your dream was right. already decaying for a, for a long while. So people were exhausted, frustrated that, you know, there is some atmosphere uh, in there about that, of this frustration and, and, and sadness. And then pandemic hits and everybody's told, stay at home, close your business. And for people that translates into this narrative that, that there, there is a purpose to it. They want to, they, the hidden powers want to kill our American dream. This is a plot against America. This is a plot against United States. This is a plot against American dream uh, to, to kill it, that this pandemic was invented exactly so that we cannot fulfill our dream and control our lives and achieve um, our, our goals and you know, be prosperous. So you have three different locations, three different societies where people say the government is lying to us, but the meaning behind this varies and is quite different for different people. Yeah, you talk about disappointment in the American dream and the 2008 market crash as one cause for the popularity of conspiracy theories, and this does make a lot of sense. Um, as I was doing fieldwork among anarchist activists during this period, though, I noticed something else that also fits within this idea of a perceived rupture in the social contract, uh, which is the effect of the politics around 9-11. OK, so in my city in Montreal, anyway, it was around uh, 2007, the people calling themselves uh, truthers started popping up at left activist events that I was always at. And they weren't particularly welcome. I write about this elsewhere, but nonetheless, they were there and their favorite talk. Of, and their favorite topic of conversation was how 9 11, uh, the attacks on the World Trade Centers in New York that day, were an inside job, right? And, uh, and many popular amateur documentaries on YouTube at this time, in its first generation of cultural production, were also organized around the question of 9 11, like uh, Loose Change, Zeitgeist. Um, and the enemy in these narratives was, was not satanic Democrats or a globalist plot against America. And they did not always highlight the role of uh, lizards or Jews um, or focus on such trivial coincidences positioned as special codes uh, the way we saw with QAnon. Um, my point is these theories weren't quite as fantastical and, and it, it does depend on the documentary. Um, and I, I reviewed a lot of them in my research. So, and a lot of them focused sort of more loosely on a plot of governments financial organizations and oil men against the little people, all um, seemingly generally inspired by what many agree were less than satisfactory official inquiries into 9-11. You know, and, and everyone, including Noam Chomsky, said that these truthers were misguided, asking the wrong questions. And in many respects, I agree. Uh, my question is, though, if the questions conspiracy theorists are asking now seem to have gotten even more misguided. Is this not possibly partially due to so many of us disregarding and ridiculing so much public mistrust of authority that was generated during this time? Um, like, and I realize Elisa is the one who lives in the United States and does most of the research there. And uh, I wonder what she'd have to say, but like, I don't know, like even if, one thinks that 9-11, like even if one thinks that 9-11 being an inside job is a completely ridiculous idea, if so many people were wondering about it, this itself should signal like a severe lack of trust, right? Or a severe rupture in the social contract. 
it seems to me that this has to be at least a factor. I think the trust is a, a very important issue and definitely um, there is a lot of research, especially done in psychology, actually, mm -hmm. uh, ar around the questions of trust, whether uh, low or high levels of trust co correlate with certain beliefs and uh, and is it about the trust who are the, the question is also who do we trust is it the big government or local government or are these doctor authorities who we see like me medical authorities that we see on tv or rather are we trusting our gps so there is a lot of research concerning that and I think questions about trust are important, but I think they resonate a lot with this Western centric idea of political organization that democracy, democracy is built on trust and mm -hmm. citizens have to uh, trust politicians. Um, and if citizens trust politicians, things will be okay, right? Yeah. Um, I think as we learn more about the world, uh, we see that very often politicians give us reasons not to be trusted. I think this is the side effect of free media, excellent media, that we learn more and more about things that are going on behind the closed doors. So people lose that trust. Um, but also I think what is important is to think about trust as a relational issue. If you, if I trust you, you have to trust me. This is a kind of relationship constantly negotiated and uh, something that happens between people. And uh, it's not given once and for all. And I think it is uh, specifically, like it is very well seen in medical uh, conspiracy theories and the issues we, we can talk about COVID and COVID vaccine and whether people trust doctors or not, but I think doctors also have to have some trust in patients and trust that when patients are asking questions, it is not malicious or because they want to undermine uh, the authority, but people have concerns that this is coming from um, from a certain position, from a certain reason, from a certain history. Um, yeah. So, so he, but also I think what is important, going back to the uh, the Western centric idea of the trust and the political organization, is I think what Matthew Carey writes very well in his work on mistrust, very well that more than often trust is luxury rather than a norm, and. Uh -huh. So many societies around the world live in a constant situation of mistrust and they have to deal with it. Um, and they have to find ways to overcome this mistrust or build the social relations within the mistrust field. Uh, and I think if we realize that, then we can see that Conspiracy theories then are less abnormality, but are just part of this world of mistrust. And maybe in the Western world, a moment of trust was just a moment. And now we can see how that dream, that, that ideal is crumbling. Yeah, like why should we trust politicians in the first place, right? Right. And I think th this is also something that we know from the research done by historians that conspiracy theories were part of the European history for a very long time, right? They were normal. They were normal way of explaining how world works up in until the ways, 1950s. In some way, yeah, well, in some ways, you know, all politics is conspiracy. So it would make sense that you'd have conspiracy theory about, you know, as long as you have politics, you're going to have conspiracy and then you're going to have conspiracy theory. Um, and what do you think happened in 1950 to change this? In the 1950s, uh, what happened uh, is that during the Cold War, after the war, during the Second World War, we could see how conspiracy theories led were a big part of the 
of the Nazism machinery. They were a big part of the regime that mobilized people to, to, to follow Hitler and to do, you know, to, they led to those atrocities. And yeah. then the same thing happened at the Stalin side, and we can see how communist regimes mobilized a lot of conspiratorial thinking to gain supporters. And they were, like, the conspiracy theories have this mad, like this fantastic ability to, uh, to, to push people's imagination, to, to gain followers, right? Right. And then we have similar things happening even in the United States or in UK in other places where uh, you where, where authorities are mobilizing conspiracy theories. Uh, right. So you have those big authorities, super empires, which are using conspiracy theories to push their agenda and fear against the enemy, mm -hmm. right? And then you have scholars who are coming proper and ad proper and others who are coming in the 50s and saying, Adorno, it's enough is enough. Like th this is madness. Yeah. And they see the results of this kind of a thinking and they want to change the narrative. They want to, uh, so they are, uh, and this is this famous Hofstadter studies where he's talking about paranoid mind, and he's on purpose chooses this very derogatory term because he's so angry with what's going on that he really wants to banish conspiracy theories from the pu public political discourse. And he, he locates it as an American phenomenon, doesn't he? He says the American right. paranoid psyche. And, and this all of this discussion is, is, again, largely happening in America, isn't it? Right. And so this is what's happening in the 50s and 60s. And then the, the conspiracy theories start to be delegitimized. And they start in the Western world to be pushed from the centers to the fringes of political uh, debate. The essay that Ella and I are referring to here is The Paranoid Style of American Politics by Richard Hofstadter, a landmark tale of American pop culture immediately following the Kennedy assassination. I say landmark because if ever I try to submit a piece on conspiracy theory to an American magazine, they want me to lead with how I agree or disagree with this guy. When Americans get paranoid, they sure do it in American ways, like in sensational descriptions of globalist plots against America. Uh, but for people to think of conspiracy theory and government as arguably not new or uniquely American, Ella points to the atrocities of the Holocaust and their connection with the fear-mongering construction of a Jewish conspiracy in many European contexts. Because yes, people specifically knowingly distributed propaganda scapegoating Jewish people for the existence of capitalism. Can we say these anti-Semitic propagandists were conspiring? Surely some of them knew what they were doing. What does it mean that, as Ella points out, in other times and places, it was taken for granted that some measure of conspiracy is involved in all politics? And that scholars may be more willing to indulge allegorical sense-making in the global South precisely because of a colonial paternalism that presumes the non-Western subject is less capable of rational analysis. Scholarship on ancient Rome suggests that conspiracy was taken for granted as an element of all politics, where it was well understood that rulers have conversations about their power and how to maintain it that are not shared publicly with their subjects. Does the category conspiracy theory function as an epithet in the global North right now, precisely because in our liberal democracies, corruption supposedly does not exist? We continue to tackle the question of how the category conspiracy theory is used in the next episode using a different kind of anthropological analysis. Instead of a comparative study using conspiracy theory as an objective category of analysis, Ella and I are going to look at how the category conspiracy theory is used by others, what it means to others, how it is used in conversation, the social work it is made to do. In other words, we're going to look at conspiracy theory as an ethnographic category, not a universal category, but a cultural category whose meaning is determined by those who use it. That's right, we're learning about anthropology as well as conspiracy theory here, people. So we, so we learn by looking at things as both objective and subjective categories. As well as using the category conspiracy theory to analyze people, we look at how people use it to analyze each other. Because that's another thing that's consistently true about conspiracy theory, is that the phrase is used subjectively to disqualify amateur theories of power from respectable consideration.
That's next time. Until then, thank you for listening. Politics After the Pandemic is brought to you by the Sociological Review Foundation in collaboration with the British Academy as part of the special section Solidarity and Care During the COVID-19 Pandemic. Erica Lagalise is an anthropologist and researcher at the London School of Economics and Loughborough University and author of the book Occult Features of Anarchism.